right. So now I'm going to hand over both mics to uh, my friend Jocelyn. Uh, could we give Jocelyn a round of applause before you even talk? You know. Here you go. All right. Put that on. It's going to follow you. Got it. Yes. Okay. You can hold that, and I'm going to switch this here. Wow, y'all, my name is Jocelyn, and I feel super privileged to be in this room this morning with all of you godly men ready to wake up early and figure out how you're going to jump into this new um, project that we're going to share about this morning. I am the Director of engagement and um, Church Engagement for the South Texas Alliance for Orphans, and we are a nonprofit that is a bridge between the church and all things happening in our community with um, families that are impacted by the foster care system. So I'm going to give you a brief update on what's happening around us, and then I'm going to pass it off to Chad, who is actually a through project mentor, and he's going to share more of the nitty gritty what it's like to be um, a man that is doing this work. So um, the reason my shirt says into the storm is because coming out of COVID, our city is in crisis when it comes to kids and the foster care system. We already had a huge capacity crisis before COVID, and unfortunately, COVID caused all of those factors that you think about that might have caused family breakdown. I mean, they were all at a huge rise, right? Um, families are stressed, jobs are lost, there is uncertainty, um, there's a lot of abuse that was happening in homes, um, kids were not in school. So all of those things put together over the last year have caused us to be in a place of um, just really dire need for the church to step in and care for families that are in crisis. And so that doesn't always just look like fostering. The Alliance works really hard to try to give um, the church opportunity to serve families before their kids could possibly be put into care. So that's kind of front door method of coming alongside of them and keeping kids from foster care. And then while children are in foster care, we are raising capacity and awareness within the church for families to step up and care for the children while hopefully their biological parents are getting healthy enough for them to return home. That's always the goal is reunification. So we're really trying to help the church to step into that space and say, yes, I'm willing to open my doors to these kiddos for a couple of months to a year while their family gets back on their feet. And then I'm going to help them reintegrate back into that biological family. And, you know, God's really into that work of um, just uh, reuniting and bringing about healing within the family, right? So that's the goal. And then we're also working on the back end of kids that are um, in care and then never in that foster adoptive or fi um, final placement where they can um, have the safe adult and family that's going to follow them throughout life. So that's what through project is a place that you guys are gonna hear about today where it's kids that are aging out of care. So that means they have been put into the foster care system and now they are in their teenage years. And so the likelihood of adoption, unfortunately, is super low at that point. Most children by the age of seven become, their statistics of being adopted are way, way lower, unfortunately. So there are a lot of kids that kind of write out the system. And whenever they get into those teenage years, the state basically is going to give them until the age of 18 with support in the foster care system. And then they give them a check and say, good luck. And so at age 18, they're sent out into the world and um, expected to be an adult and functioning well in society. I don't know about you, but at 18, I was not prepared to do that on my own. And I had a very stable home and believing parents that raised me, um, you know, to know Jesus. So this is a huge gap that we can fill in our community to come alongside of these teens and help them have that one safe adult that they can look to for mentorship and encouragement to walk alongside them as they do try to take on the world on their own, essentially. Um, I gave you guys, I hope there's enough for everyone. And those of you guys online, I can actually send a digital copy to through email, but this is kind of a stat sheet um, that we have for the Alliance. And it does talk about statistics for foster care. Right now we're at a, a more than an 800 number deficit of foster families in Bear County. So that means kids coming into foster care right now are being sent outside of our county because there are not enough homes. And that's devastating already that they're getting put into care, but to be sent outside of their community is a whole nother ball game because it makes um, all things harder as far as um, staying connected with what they know. 
Um, there's some other stats at the bottom of this page about numbers of kids in care. If you flip over to the back, um, the impact after care is more the numbers that we're going to be looking at today. Um, unfortunately, many of the victims of sex trafficking in our community have been touched by foster care and um, also the homeless population. So um, when we talk about all of these big things within the community that a lot of times you hear on the news and we're like, oh, somebody should work with these guys going into prison. Somebody should work with this homeless population. Somebody should work with these sex tra trafficking victims. Well, through project is a preventative measure in all of those capacities in all of those um, realms. So it's really exciting that you can come alongside of one man and make an impact and cause those statistics to change. It's totally doable. So that's what we want to hear um, to share with you guys today, um, just what that looks like. And I'm going to invite Chad to come up and share just what he's done with his um, mentee. And um, Chad is a friend. He's a fellow adopt, foster adopt dad. I actually get the pleasure of working with his wife, Beth Ann, at the Alliance. He also has a couple doctorates, and I'll butcher all that, so I'm just going to let him introduce himself. <laughs> but he's super smart and awesome man to be coming here this morning to share with you guys about this project. Oh, yep, here's this part. Pass all of that. I feel privileged to have two microphones this morning. So uh, good morning, those of you that are virtual. Good morning for those of you that are here in person. Um, again, I am Chad Jackson. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just, I go by Chad. Uh, but I am a professor in my, uh, in my day job. Uh, but it's not, being, a, being a, a teacher is not the thing that I'm most passionate about. It's um, leaving a legacy for my kids, for my family, for my community. Um, and so uh, that's what I, I hope to convey some opportunities that you guys uh, can have to really make a big impact in the lives of others and le continue to leave a legacy. Um, so hopefully you guys uh, have already started on your legacy, right? Okay. So I wanna, I wanna uh, just uh, kick off my portion this morning uh, to, to say, or to put out my challenge, right? So I, I like engagement um, when I work with my students uh, so I ask them questions to reflect upon. So my question to you, that, or my challenge to you this morning is, I want you to be praying about how God wants to use you, okay? And that may, that may happen this morning, okay? So I want you to even, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to pause in a moment and just we're going to ask God to speak to us, to speak to our hearts this morning. And what does he want to say to you, okay? And then what, what's the action that he wants you to take, Okay. So often when we pray and we hear, I, I, at least I've been guilty of this, I pray and, and God shows something, he puts something out there and I don't always act and move on it, okay? And so that's really the, where the impact comes. So I want you just to pause this morning and God, I pray that you um, would challenge us. What is it that you want to say to our hearts uh, this morning? And may we receive that. And Lord, give us the faith and the courage to act out of what you're saying to us. Thank you for your guidance and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want you to um, think back, okay? Um, think back to who taught you. Think about your formative years when you were a teenager, okay? Is that bringing back some good memories? Some, might, for some of us, it might bring back some painful memories. Just being honest. Um, but think back to those former years. Who taught you how to dress appropriately? Okay. Who taught you how to shave? Who taught you how to drive? How to make basic financial decisions? How to interview for a job? And, and again, we could go on and on, fill in the blank, right? Now, some of those things were caught, right? But for a lot of us, those things were uh, intentionally or maybe unintentionally taught by the people that, that helped form us. And it may, be, it may have been our parents. It may have been friends. It may have been mentors. Okay. So that's, what, that's kind of the frame that I want you to think about. Think about I mean, who had an impact in your life in those four years, 14 to 20, right? 
And for a lot of us, that's multiple people. Okay. For those of you that are on Zoom, I know we're on a swivel and I tend to move. So I'm gonna try to anchor myself. So I'm not to make you dizzy because I could, I could spin around the room. Um, so for the through project, I don't, I don't work for the through project. I have served as a mentor. Uh, Jocelyn already talked about, uh, she works for the South Texas Alliance for Orphans. My wife's pretty passionate about that as well um, and, and loves to carry forth the mission uh, that we have, that the, that the Alliance has. But I got involved with the through project probably about five years ago. Uh, my wife and I moved to San Antonio nine years ago. And um, I lived here about eight weeks before my family moved down from Missouri. From, I'm from Northwest Missouri. Um, and, you know, they, they say everything's bigger in Texas. Um, yeah, I, I do believe that. Um, uh, the traffic, um, the humidity. Um, anyway, uh, I could go on and on. Uh, but I love my time. But I lived, I lived on the campus of UIW. I teach for UIW. And they allowed me to rent a room uh, for the summer before I found a house. And so I remember coming home from church one Sunday. Um, I don't even remember what church I, I visited. Coming back to my apartment and I'm, I'm praying, God, what is it you want my family? How do you want us to get involved in the community when I come? And I remember God just, you ever, you ever been smacked, smacked by God? Okay, and maybe some of you can relate. So that's how it was for me, okay? And God says, now is the time He'd already planted some seeds. I just wasn't acting on them uh, when I lived back in Missouri to make an impact uh, with kids from vulnerable situations. And so we moved, my wife and family moved down in August. And I think by October, we were signed up to become foster parents or to take the training. Okay. And so you go through the training, the process. And by May, we had our first placement. And so we've fostered a few kids. Uh, along the way, some long term, <clears throat> some short term. We've adopted out of foster care. Uh, <clears throat> there's some there's some pain. And you, you're dealing with brokenness. The through project. Uh, these kids come from uh, from hard places and come from uh, broken situations. So it takes patience. It takes um, really the Holy Spirit working on your own heart, uh, being being transparent with them, and in a coaching manner. Um, but things are not, they, they come from places that we, most of us don't come from those situations, okay? So it takes a, a keen understanding of that. Uh, but after we had a long-term placement, my wife says, I, I need a break. We need a break. We need to not foster for a, a short time. And so we took some time off and I decided to, you know, continue to work uh, full-time and go back to school, okay? So work on another degree uh, that God had put before me. Uh, so I'm busy and I'm like, I'm also hearing that God wants me to mentor. Okay. And so I, I got connected with the three projects. That's something we did in our church, in our life group. We filled out an application. And uh, it, if you're like, Hey, I want to go mentor next week. If you walk out of here, you might take a little bit longer than that. Okay. I, I don't know. It, it's just the speed of getting the, the background, uh, your application processed and the background uh, check uh, done. Um, so I did that. Uh, so we got, I got matched with, uh, with Dre. Uh, Dre has been in foster care since he was three. Okay. And Dre is 18. Okay. So he's had a lot of inconsistencies in his life. Do you think Dre thinks and acts like an 18 year old? In a lot of ways, he thinks and acted like my 11 year old. So you have also have to have that understanding, right? Okay, okay. I'm not expecting, think about where I was at 18. I can't have that same expectation. So when you mentor, just a piece of advice, um, if you move forward and say, I wanna, I wanna try this, I wanna fill out the application, I wanna get matched, uh, you guys can have a great impact in the lives of someone, but just make sure you go into it with the expectation that you're leaving your expectations on the table. <laughs> Okay, God, how can I make an impact? How can I coach? How can I ask good questions and show them and meet them where they're at? How did Jesus, did, did Jesus encounter people and say, I want you to live up to my expectations? He set the bar high, right? He said, think about the lady he met at the well, right? What did he tell her? He met her right where she was at. Did he scold her? 
Did he say, you need to do this? He, he gave, gave her a command. What was it? Go and sin no more. Okay. Right. So we can cha I challenge Dre. Hey, Dre, when you, when you make that decision, it's, is that the wisest decision? is it? I ask questions, right? I didn't tell him what to do. I ask questions. Hey, Dre, when, when you go and buy the hot dog at the gas station and put it on your, your debit card and you don't have any money in your account, that's a 35 or $37.39 hot dog, okay? Which he did multiple times. And so how did he get around that? Uh, I just canceled my bank card and I don't pay it and I, I run from it because that's what I've done my whole life. Okay. Um, so have that level of understanding, right? But those are, those are impactful things like, Hey, Dre, have, have you thought about getting a job? Yes. Okay. I've applied. Okay. Well, where have you applied? Uh, well, I went online and I applied for some things. Are you qualified? I don't. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. What makes you qualified? And so let's look through, let's, and so we've sat down for a couple hours and looked through and coached, okay, some practical things. Uh, how are you going to dress when you get called for that interview? I don't know. Okay, let's talk about that. Do you have clothes, right? And through projects, they do get, um, he was at a place where he was getting some financial assistance uh, for clothing. Okay, now, what do you think that he took that a lot of money for clothes and spent on clothes? or Netflix and a gaming system, okay? So again, basic financial things that you and I would say, well, I need to take care of my needs and not my wants, okay? But he didn't come from that environment. So think about how could you, how could you coach uh, someone like that? So Dre and I, I had a, a mentoring relationship with him for about uh, almost two years. And then he moved, uh, he moved away. He was, uh, he got into some independent housing. So we helped him with that transition uh, along with um, some of the other places in town that connect with the through project and help with housing. If you go to the through project website, they do talk about, uh, you know, they are, they are bridging the gap between foster care and adulthood. But again, how do they do that? They do that through uh, some of their partners but ultimately they do that through mentorship. And so uh, in the last 10 years, they've reached 721 youth. Uh, that's a pretty big impact. Uh, you might think in 10 years, is that really? Um, but yes, there's 471 youth match with mentors in the last 10 years. And then they have a step housing program and then uh, some other uh, apartment uh, to independent living uh, projects as well. The numbers are a little lower for that. Um, so Dre moved on and, uh, I was hitting the point in my, uh, my dissertation where I really needed to put more time and focus on that. So it was probably hit a good point for me in that. Um, and so he, he was, he lived away and lived up in Dallas for about eight months. And then, uh, he moved back and he emailed me and says, Hey, would you, I'm, I'm coming back. So by this point, he's 21. And he said, will you be my mentor? I said, Dre. Um, I do, I do care about you, but I'm just, I'm not in a place to do that. So how does that look on a month to month? And this is why I didn't feel like I could do it. Um, we had that going on. Uh, we were getting pulled back into, uh, my wife says, I think, I think God's saying we need to, to get back and, and get relicensed, um, and to be a full-time foster family again. And so I have, I have right now have five, five kids. I, Yeah trying to think. <laughs> uh, you might think, how do you not know how many kids you have, right? Uh, but that's, uh, people ask me, how many kids do you have? I said, well, today I have five. Okay. That might change. And that always gets people like, you know, and, and some of you maybe have lost a child, right? And so maybe that's my, where people's minds go. And, and that's not to diminish that, that, that pain, that, that hurt. Um, but when, when, you, when you bring a kid in and you, and you parent and love them for a year or a year and a half as Jaws the family has done, uh, and they leave, you've lost a child. Um, and, and that hurts. But if, if it didn't hurt, you didn't love them well enough, right? And so, so here, I, I'm, I'm bouncing around a little bit. Let me get back to, to, my, to Dre. Because back and I said, Dre, I think you need someone else. There's another mentor for you, okay? 
So it is for, sometimes it's for a season. Um, if you're expecting uh, transformational results, don't leave your expectations on the table. Say, God, I'm hearing what you want me to do. I'm going to step into that and I'm going to trust you to use me, okay, with my expectations aside, okay? I'm just being real here, guys, because uh, when we have, when we impart our expectations, and that's, I'm a, I'm a high achiever and I have expectations for myself, and that's where I get myself into trouble is when I project my expectations on others, okay? Doesn't mean I can't challenge, doesn't mean I can't set the bar high, okay? But I have to be careful. Um, and I have to love, it's hard to love well if I'm putting my expectations in the front. And so uh, I haven't, I don't know where Dre's at today. Um, just due to not having consistent phone, uh, email addresses, um, even, even coaching, uh, your, you might wanna set up a new email account because the name of that may not invite people to give you an interview for that job. So again, basic things that all of you, each of you could mentor to, okay? Um, so I completed my degree last December. Um, we got, uh, God put it on our heart in November at a guy's retreat that, um, hey, I think that this six-year-old over here that needs a home, I think you guys are it. And was already in foster care. And so we did weekend visits for way too long because our court system is quite broken. Um, and so she was placed with us uh, in last month. No, we're in June now, in April. And so now I have five kids. Okay, but I think God is also challenging me. Now that you got your degree out of the way, it's time to get back and be a mentor for the third project. Okay, so that's something that I'm hearing that I need to act on uh, because um, we can make a difference. We can leave a legacy. But um, so that, that's that's my challenge. So what are you hearing? Okay. And then what are you going to act on? So with a three projects, um, again, there's different ways to get involved. How does that look on a, on a week to week or month to month basis? So here's how I did it with Dre. If they're, if they're under 18, they ask you not to uh, go pick them up and drive them around town. Okay. They can, they give them a bus pass and they can take the bus to where you're at. Sometimes that's a bit challenging. Dre was eight, uh, 17, 18, maybe it's 17. They ask you not to do that if they're under 17. So uh, Dre came to the bus stop. I live uh, in the kind of Bandera 1604 area. And I would go down to Walmart and Bandera and Gilbo and at the bus transfer station and pick him up. Sometimes I would drive down to um, Midtown and pick him up there where he lived. Uh, and he would, uh, what, we just made it a, a weekly rhythm. He would come to church with us and we would feed him lunch and he would hang out with my kids in the backyard and play catch and my kids actually loved it. Um, uh, he doesn't look like my family, which is great. And my kids, uh, my kids loved on him. And uh, he saw himself as someone trying to interact with, I don't know if he thought himself, that, thought that he was making a big impact on my kids, but he, he saw uh, that's kind of his place, right? I can go out and I can hang out with kids outside and even keep an eye on them uh, when they were younger. Uh, but the three projects ask you to connect with them once a month, okay? So meet up with them for a couple of hours once a month. You could have something structured. You can ask them to meet you in a park. Uh, you can ask them, you can invite them in your home. That's kind of up to you, okay? But once a month connect, uh, they do, if they're, in the, if they're in the program, then they do give them a, uh, a phone, a non-data plan phone, okay, to where they could call and you could connect with them that way, okay? Um, I don't know if, that, if that's still what they're doing. Like I said, it's been uh, a little while since I've, I've mentored, um, but you kind of get to work with the mentee and what skills they want to achieve, okay, in life. And so it might be a 19 year old, it might be a 14 year old, but they're gonna take your interest and they're gonna to try to match you up with the youth and then they supervise your connection point, okay? So they'll arrange, they'll contact you and say, hey, I have a, I have a, a, a youth here, a young man, um, we think that you might be a good fit. And they'll connect you and uh, allow you guys to meet, uh, 
at their where, where they're at where they're located and um and you'll get to decide is this do i want to do i want to do this so i want to move forward okay you do have a say in that okay and then how long is this a year is this six months uh it kind of depends on uh the youth it depends on you okay i would say if you're going to do it just be open to how long it could be that would be my that would be my advice anyway um but again they may they may meet with you a couple of times and they may not show up okay oh we're can, we're supposed to meet this time and they might stand you up okay how are you going to handle that those are all things you have to kind of work through process through because it may be um, they just missed the bus and they their phone got shut off. So it's not personal. <laughs> That's what I'm getting at, right? Um, but but you can connect back with through project and say, hey, they've no showed twice. Uh, and here's some way, and, and they'll work with them and they'll find out, uh, dig into that. Okay. So um, those are the challenges that we uh, uh, that we have. Um, as Jocelyn said, we are overwhelmed as a community uh, in San Antonio. Uh, when we live in the foster care world, and that's the through project, that's kids aging out, that's families who need support, uh, there's lots of ways to get involved. Okay? I had a placement one time. Uh, she was with us for 13 months. Jocelyn knows the situation well. And her great grandparents said, I want to adopt her. So at 71 and 72, I'm not there yet. Okay. I don't want to be adopting a two-year-old. Okay. No, no offense to anyone here or any child that's two. Um, that's just not something. I'm done with babies. I'm done. <laughs> uh, I love the six-year-old that comes in my house. And uh, you know, I can be in my 60s when they're, you know, in high school. That's that's okay. Um, but we're we're not done until until God has us done. Right. And so there's different ways to be involved. Jocelyn, I, I want to, this doesn't have, anything to, through, uh, doesn't have anything to do with the through project, but Jocelyn said something earlier about families who need, to, who need help. So when a child, a children get removed from home, and Jocelyn, you can correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, um, the, the children will be placed in a foster home if there's one available. If not, they, the, the caseworker may be staying with them at the office. And that does happen. That's happening right now. Um, but the parents um, are either at a loss or are uh, too, too deep in their addiction, okay? But they don't have support. The bio families don't have support or wraparound support. And that's, that's an impact that it doesn't matter where we're at in life, that we can have an impact in that family, okay? And so it might be encouraging them. It might be mentoring them. Okay, we don't have a formal mentorship program for bio families that have their kids taken away, but the church can make a big impact and step into that. Um, I think about at my church right now, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a family, a single mom, not single mom, I think her um, dad's abusive, um, getting ready to leave mom, um, the three small kids, she doesn't have a job. And so one of the life groups is trying to provide that wraparound support and try to salvage the marriage um, and try to work on how do we equip uh, dad to where he's not verbally and physically abusive. Okay. And so that's an impact that we can make uh, as a church because that's really what they need. They need, they need uh, encouragement, coaching, some life skills, some family skills. Okay. So I'm just throwing out other ways that we can have an impact that it's mentoring, right? It is mentoring, but it doesn't require you to be a 24-7 uh, missionary by uh, having kids placed in your home, okay? Although there's a ton of joy, there's nothing that my family has ever done that has given us more joy and grow, grown us more than fostering, than bringing kids in our home. My kids have a greater worldview uh, that I could have never taught them, but life teaches them by inviting this in our home. I think all my kids realize that, or at least my bio kids realize that, you know, they're 16, 14, and uh, 13, they realize, um, yeah, drugs have a big impact, right? Life choices that I make now have a huge impact on my whole life. 
Okay, so I need, I need to make some wise decisions now because of what I'm seeing, the brokenness of the system. All right, I've thrown a lot of stuff at you. What questions do you guys have? What questions? Yes. Your, your kids, uh, how old are they? So my, uh, my bio kids right now are um, 16, almost 15, and 13. And then we've adopted one. She's been with us since she was three months old. She's seven right now. Yeah, and then a six six year old foster daughter that will that will adopt here in about five six months. How old were they when you first started doing all this? Uh, that was we started about eight and a half years ago. Yep. So you know, for my one of them, he was four. So that's he that's that's all he can remember. Right. That we've had caseworkers in our home, and uh, we've been able to encourage. Uh, bio families through the process and coach and love them well in the midst of their brokenness. Other questions? Yes. That understanding uh, the older ones, they do not understand the So like th with a through project, is that what you're saying? Yeah, they do not, like, they, they live, that's a great question, Jim, right? Okay. Um, yeah, Jim asked if, if uh, for those of you on Zoom, ask if the older kids or the, the ones through the through, through project, do they live on their own? Yes, they do. Okay, they live on their own. Uh, they have some um, semi-independent housing. It's like a, a, a mentor, like a house parent that that lives in the house. It's not residential. I guess it could be. Some of them are residential here, uh, if they're if we still have that. Right, uh, that's another uh, thing that's part of the brokenness of the system that we have. Residential care facilities are being closed. So, but yeah, they they have housing. Yeah. Or could they come and live with you? Oh, could they? Um, that's a great question. I, I think there are some avenues with that. If you are like, hey, God's challenging me to uh, to basically be a, a, I guess, a surrogate parent, right? Um, and, and there are different levels. I'm, I'm, Jocelyn probably know the terminology, but uh, like I've actually adopted. So like they're mine, right? But there's also, um, oh, what's the other term? Of, I, I'm not adopting, but I'm legally responsible. Yeah. I mean, if they're under the age of 18, you would have to become a licensed foster. Yes. To yes. So, so teens, if they were going to live in your home before they were legally an adult, then you would have to become trained and licensed. Yeah, so Joss was saying if they're under 18, you would have to become a licensed uh, foster home uh, for them to come live with you. But if they're over 18, you, you can be like, hey, I want to, uh, you call me dad, right? I'll be your dad and, until I'm gone, right? That is, that is something you can do. Um, other questions? Yes. What's the process? I mean, I'm sure that you're in the training. Yes. So the, the, for, for the through project, um, you can, the way I went through it, but again, they may have changed their process and I, I should have looked up to see what their process was, but it was a, a, an application and it, which included a background check. Okay. And then uh, they called me or uh, they processed that and they're like, okay, there's a, there's about an hour or two training that we want you to go through. Uh, they may be offering that virtual now. It might be in person. It is all virtual. It's all virtual right now. Okay. Uh, so there's a, a we, uh, the guy who did it for us, uh, he was uh, a foster parent, came through the foster care system. He worked for the through project at the time. And uh, he actually came to our life group um, and uh, did the training for all of us at that time. So it's not it, it's not a high time cost uh, to to get started, uh, but the first step is to uh, fill out the application. That's uh, where they can run your background check. So, great question. And Paul, if someone on Zoom has a question, they can just call. Okay. All right. I don't know if I, you can say that 
Yeah, so if you're on Zoom and you have a question, feel free to ask. So Jim asked a question, what kind of financial uh, commitment uh, should be expected if you're a mentor through the through project? Uh, really, that's up to you. Like they ask that there not be financial transactions. Okay, but that's not to say that my wife and I did, or my wife didn't take Dre out and do some clothes shopping for, so he could have some decent clothes for a job interview. But that's something that we felt compelled to do. Um, but uh, Dre knew how to manipulate situations because that's what he grew up with, right? And so we had that level of understanding. And so, you know, he would come and say, hey, can I have 10 bucks? I'm like, for what? Uh, well, I need this uh, I, uh, for to get my clothes washed. I said, well, why don't you bring your clothes with you and you can do it at my house. So I'm not, I'm not giving him cash because I, I, I highly doubt that it was actually going to go. No, he, he wasn't buying drugs. Uh, you know, he wasn't involved in that. So don't, don't, we don't have to go there. Uh, but, uh, you know, buying Twinkies and, and soda, the gas station is probably where it was going to go. Right. Let's just be honest. Um, cause he was thinking like a 12 year old. In other ways. So th there's really no, uh, I mean, big financial impact uh, if you want to take them to, to top golf or if you want to, uh, you know, take them and, and do something fun, um, then, then yeah, you're not going to expect them to pay for that. You're going to pay for that, right? Uh, but if it's, hey, we're going to go to church and he's going to stay for dinner um, and hang out with us, that's, that's a pretty small commitment. But great question. There's another question over here. Yes. So if you're going to do what? If you're going to, if you want to be involved in the bridge program, it was to make would it still be valuable to go to the Okay, so you're saying would it, would it be valuable to go through and have the foster, if, you, if you're going to be trained as a foster parent, even if you were just going to do it, give you a deeper level of understanding? I'm not going to say no, but but there's a lot that goes into that. That's a that's a process. Usually, the quickest I can get we can get trained as a to be a foster parent is a couple months, right, Jocelyn? Uh, yeah, yeah. We can do it quicker than that, but there are like uh, the agency I, I'm with. I'm with One Hope in town. Um, there, there is a. They have a. Um, one of their training is about a two or three hour training that is for people that are interested. Okay. And that's a great thing to just go and have a deeper level of understanding without committing to going through the whole thing. Okay. That's a great question. Yes, Paul. Can you talk a little bit about what the training session covers? Oh, training session for through project. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the training session for the through project, uh, it entails, uh, kind of what you would expect. Uh, some of the stuff that I've already shared with you, like what they what they expect you to do once a month. Don't be giving them money. Uh, they can take the bus. Those types of things will lay all that. But they'll also they'll also get into don't don't impart uh, your preferences. You may have you may have kids who uh, again we live in a broken world, right? And and the kids that are uh, in the foster care system wrestle with identity. I would say identity crisis, okay? And along with that, sometimes is their sexual orientation uh, is something that they uh, uh, struggle with or are confused about. And so they might have a whole different worldview and ideal than you do, okay? And so they, they bring awareness to that to say, are you gonna be okay with this if the mentee and, 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 and Dre's, I'll give you an example. Dre was, um, he was with us um, for about a year, I think. You know, we had the relationship. And he, he says, well, I'm gay. Okay. What now, Dre? Like, is, are you expecting that to change our relationship? Like, and so I think that that surprised him. Like, I was expecting some pushback. I was expecting... Uh, to get uh, pushed around at church. Um, you know, he went with us to church. Uh, we serve at our church. We, we attend two services. Uh, and so he would be with me. Okay. Uh, but he wanted to go serve on his own. I'm like, ah, 
uh, hold on. Uh, I had some concerns of uh, him uh, uh, being a greeter, right? If you're, and again, I'm not saying that we, we, you have to live a perfect life to be a greeter at church, right? Uh, but if you're going to go out and live this way, then that's your choice, okay? And so I had to talk them through and, and, and kind of coach him on uh, some of those, I don't want to say expectations, but, but God has a standard. Uh, and, and some of those things. So, uh, but some of that was for, uh, was he really? I don't know. Uh, was it for some shock value? Maybe. Okay. But how are you going to handle it? And so that's some of the training that they'll take you through is like, how, how are you going to deal with this? Right. Uh, because they don't, it's not like my, my best friend that I grew up with this, with that family and it's, their kids are great. Okay. I'm not saying these kids aren't great but they come from very different places. Okay. And I grew a lot in, in just in my ability to, to mentor and coach and listen just, just by doing that for a couple of years with Dre. Other questions? Uh, that, that's a process. Um, did I see some growth? Yes. Did I see rapid growth? Like if any of you entered into, um, hey, I want to go through some leadership training, okay? And you're going to grow through that process, right? Because you're initiating it and it's something you want. It, the growth is not that rapid. Like that's a safe way of saying that, right? And so that's where I have to suspend my expectations um, because... Did he mature? Yes. Is he still going to be delayed in his uh, maturity? Absolutely. Uh, because of his, what he, what he came from. So how does that help him? Sure. So, so, so Jim's asking the question of how, how does that mentorship, if he's still delayed in his uh, maturity, how is that helping? How's the mentoring helping him? It's, it's the consistency, encouragement, teaching them life skills. Um, where we see the maturity lacking is always being consistent to follow through like you and I would follow through, right? Um, it, got, it was definitely better. Like he was able to implement some of the things that we had be intentional to, to coach and talk about. My wife and I would sit down with them and say, okay, Drake, when you come next week, what do you want to work on? Or what's, what's a goal that you have for this month? Let's develop that together. He may not know how to develop a goal, okay? But what is it you want to achieve? And then let me help you. Let's help design a goal for that. So we're intentional on the objective. Yes? What's the rest of his week like? What's the rest of uh, Dre's week like? Um, it's a good question. They do have, uh, in the housing that they do, there are some, there are some things that they have to, uh, to, to be able to stay living there that they have to do. So there are some training and some, um, that they have to go through. They have to uh, show that they're looking for or applying for X amount of jobs or they're working. And he ended up getting a job when he was when, when we, in our mentor relationship. And he kept that for a while. Is there meals? Keep house? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So again, some life skills. It's not just the relying on you as a mentor to do all the life skill training. Um, th there's some of that is set up in, in the project um, of where they're living. Yeah. Yes. Uh, as somebody who's also been touched by this whole process about mm -hmm. y'all both mentioned it several times, and I don't know that I'm necessarily asking you to give me a full resource on all of it. But I'm just curious if either the South Texas Alliance or the Food Project, are they behind the scenes besides the front end view of what y'all are doing? Are y'all behind the scenes trying to fix this system, fix the court system? Or are there, I mean, are there groups and entities out there that are doing that as a part of it? Because my experience with it as a dean, and I'll just say it as a grandparent, who's about to adopt two of his daughter's children. Mm -hmm. um, the system is wise. Yes. And it's totally destroyed. Yep. And it's, 
it's extremely difficult, even from our side of things, and as much control as we have, why do people meet this in dreams? And I'm just curious if Twin Projects South Texas Alliance, although this is what we do every day, we have a faction and a group and a lobbyist that are working on it. So, so the, for those of you on Zoom, the, the question is, uh, is the South Texas Line for Orphans, the other, uh, the Through Project and other entities helping to influence change in the brokenness of the system, the foster care system, the court system? Okay, essentially, I think that's what you're asking. Because as a foster parent or as a, as a, as a family member getting ready to adopt um, grandchildren or, or it's a kinship placement, we have no say. Or we have no voice, right? Uh, because the court's going to make the decision that they're going to make uh, without our input. That's just that's just the reality of it. Uh, I, I know that um, there is opportunity to have more advocacy, and I know there's the agencies. They come together. They have more of a consortia. Uh, I know I worked with uh, one of the entities here in town. Uh, last fall to say, okay, we have a legislative session starting up. How can we start doing some uh, lobbying, some advocacy? Uh, so that's something that the South Texas Alliance for Orphans is starting to do. Um, I've worked with the director, her and I've uh, met a couple of times. Of what, what steps can we take to, to influence change? But it's hard um, and it's not gonna happen overnight. That's a great question. And it, is, it can be extremely frustrating as for, for foster parents who I've been a foster parent for almost nine years. Um, you get a little jaded, like a little cynical, because the system is, is broken. So we live in a very broken world. Um, and that's, that kind of puts the exclamation point on it from your experience, right, and from mine. Yes? Um, if the need arises, is there, are there counseling resources to help that? If it, you ran into a problem with, with Dre and all of a sudden- Sure. It just means you're through. It just means yeah. this is a little bit beyond what- Absolutely, have, yes. Have, yep. The skills, is there- Somebody you can bring yes. So, so you you can uh, connecting back to the through project. Um, I, I forget their title, but they're the one who does the matching. Connect back to them. But what I have done was, hey, Dre brought something like, I don't know. I kicked it out to my my circle. Like, how would you handle this? Uh, what kind of resources do you think that we can do for this? Right. And so that's that's how we've handled it in the past. We did connect with the through project, but. Uh, you're never on, out on an island on your own. Yeah, it's a great question. Yes, Jim. How accurate is the abuse of uh, the, the uh, foster children by the foster parents? Uh, can you be a potential way of penetration pretty excessive? So I would just like how accurate is that? So, Jim, your question is. Um, what we hear in the news of foster families abusing kids who have been placed in their home. Is that what you're asking? How accurate is that? Um, I would say, I would be cautious to say that what you're hearing is the majority. Uh, are there some isolated incidents? Absolutely. Um, but part of the brokenness of the system that we have and as a, as a foster parent, if I took in a teenager, and that teen came in and falsely accused uh, my wife or I of something. Uh, the state can come in and take all of my kids, okay? And, um, and we would never get licensed again, okay? That's the other side of it, right? Has that happened before? Yes, it has, okay? So uh, if we do it from logic, and I am watching the, the clock. Um, if we do it from a logical standpoint, why would I do it? But as I pray and as I hear, what is God calling me to act on? Okay, that's why we do it. We step out in faith. Um, so I would say it's a little bit probably embellished because there's always two sides of the story. Okay. All right, I'm gonna, uh, I will provide uh, Paul my contact information. So if you have other questions, you could uh, get with him and he could provide that to you. Uh, probably the easiest way for that to happen, but I'm gonna turn it over to Paul to wrap us up. Yes, not one, but two mics. Yes, wow. Uh, 
I get the sense that there'd even be more questions and just things to, to talk through and figure out. So, uh, and I think you guys are good hang around a little bit afterwards in case anyone else has any more questions that they want to ask. But guys, thanks for being here, being uh, invested in at least thinking about this. And as he said, this is, I mean, the, the burden uh, and the blessing of this whole initiative is too much for any one person to take on. Uh, but the fact is like, as a church, that's our thing to share burdens and all kind of have a part. And I think that's exactly what, uh, that that this whole this whole thing is all about um so yeah they'll be hanging around afterwards we got this uh, whole thing recorded that you can refer back to later uh but why don't we why don't we pray we're at our time heavenly father you you have a heart for those who are far uh far from love uh, and far from you and god you sent your son jesus uh, to make us be adopted into your family and brought into your kingdom. Uh, we were uh, alienated and far from you, and yet you brought us near. So God, I pray for each person in this room. Let us have the, the faith and the humility and the courage uh, to pray and to listen, to be attuned to what you may be calling us to do. And for all the kids who are in desperate need uh, to know your love, God, we pray for all of them. We pray for our city uh, and all the systems at place that are a part of this, that it all may glorify you. Uh, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.